So my name is Adam Colbers, I'm the HIMSS Innovator in Residence, and I have the, the fun joy of uh, being shared between a couple different organizations. Um, so just, uh, I forgot to include the disclaimer slide, but basically uh, these views don't necessarily represent HHS and or HIMSS, it's sort of a brief overview of some of the work I'm doing. I'm in the Innovator in Residence program, uh, Mark Scrimshire, and the uh, bright yellow shirt's also in the program. Uh, all complaints, uh, please uh, refer to him. Uh, so the, the, the bar's been set high. I, uh, I was called out yesterday, so I'm like thinking either, um, you know, they put me last. That means they're expecting to be incredibly good or incredibly bad uh, because they put me at to the end of the presentation. But uh, I've got quite a bit of material I'm going to cover, so I'm going to kind of try to speed through some of the beginning. Uh, but uh, I want to give kind of a little background on matching. Um, and it's also really cool to see the work Mark uh, Braunstein's did. Um, uh, so, uh, E. Jeff and I, uh, a while back, actually did a, a patient matching on fire event, and that is, is neat to see the evolution, and some of the original fire profiles were, were developed uh, uh, there, so it's really cool to see how things have progressed. Um, so, background on matching. So, you know, there's a lot of different terms. What is patient matching? So, it's comparing data from multiple sources to identify records that represent the same patient. Um, typically involves uh, varied demographic fields from different health data stores. And the goal, right, is we talked about this all week, it's, it's to create a unified view of the patient, right? So you want the right data at the right uh, place so that the physicians can make the best decisions, not have to reorder lab tests. Um, and if you think of it as a pyramid, right, so it kind of starts at the bottom. So you start with attributes, right? So most records, you have first name, last name, date of birth. And so you're going to make a comparison on all these individual attributes, right? And so fire is important in that. Uh, one of the first things you have to do is clean up the data, and so if it's already structured um, in the same format, it simplifies the whole matching process. So, uh, so once we have our attributes, we do comparison on our, our combination of attributes, and we move up the pyramid to identity matching. So we're measuring similarity scores of the groups of the attributes. So we might take first name, last name, date of birth, gender, uh, and use all that to... Uh, to create a score in which we, we can say, okay, I'm, uh, if I have a 99 score, that I'm, I'm pretty confident that these two people are the same thing and a probabilistic matcher. And then the end goal, right, identity analysis. We want to create links between different patients, um, right? So if you think of, you know, in the real world, a guy named Jonathan Smith, and he, you know, he's, you know, 63 years old, he's had a heart attack, he's a diabetic, right? He's been to different providers. He has endocrinologists, primary care, cardiologists, lab data, right? And, and all these different views of Jonathan Smith are represented differently in different data stores. And so we need ways that we can automatically reconcile this. So in his endocrinologist, uh, they're really strict. They collect the data straight off uh, his driver's license. So they have Jonathan W. Smith. Uh, but his primary care doctor, right, they call him S Smitty. Uh, so he's been going there for a while, and so he's Smitty to them. And uh, so they're the same person, but they're represented digitally differently. And so you have to, you have to reconcile this somehow. And, and, and it actually becomes really hard when you start compounding this over data sources. So fundamentally, like, my work boils down to this, right? We have data plus algorithms inks equals linked data, right? So the goal is to create the links to the different pieces of data. And, and, and there's two key elements, right? So I can improve the quality of the data uh, to get better matches, or I can get better algorithms, and that's all gonna give me better data, right? So uh, one of the tough things about matching is it's not just the algorithms, it's also the quality of the data. So I just include this, I'm gonna just kind of fly through this. It has some significant dates in patient matching with some of the different algorithms. Uh, Soundex uh, is still in use today. It was actually originally developed in 1918. Uh, Felge-Sunter, uh, 1969, is a very common algorithm that's used for probabilistic matching. Um, and I just have a bunch of different timelines. I'm going to keep flying for time's sake. So challenges to matching. So here's some of the work uh, we're, I'm doing with Northwestern. So what data elements do we have to work with? So what are the building blocks? What, what pieces uh, are available? So one of the things that we're finding out right now, so social security number uh, is going down. And I have some more current uh, data. We actually have uh, eight sites now, and the trend's holding. So SSN's going down. So that has implications for the ability to, to link data in the future. Um, email's going up, right? It's jumping up quite a bit. So this is uh, uh, potentially a really good target for future matching strategies for elements to use to incorporate in your matching algorithm. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier, right? Data quality. So garbage in, garbage out. Um, data entry errors increase the complexity, um, you know, missing or incomplete values and accurate data, fat fingers, uh, information's out of date, transport, 
transposed names, misspelled names, all these factors go into your ability to link the data. Um, and I've kind of already hit some of this, so I'm going to keep going, right? But here's another problem that I've sort of hit on, right? So one of the things that became clear when I started my work is that when I'd ask people how well they match, is they would, people would tell me, oh, I can match at 90% or I can match at 60%. And I would kind of drill down and I would say, well, what does that mean? And, they, and, and people would tend to be stumped, right? Because there, there's certain types of, there, there's really only four, maybe five, we could debate four or five outcomes that a matching algorithm can have, right? And I'm gonna go over them in a bit. But one of the, one of the clear challenges, right? I can't boil the ocean, there's one of me, I didn't have a budget, I said, you know, what can I do? And so when I was at the National Library of Medicine, uh, I did some evaluation work and modified a natural language processing algorithm to extract adverse drug events. And the first thing you do is you, you evaluate it. You say, how good or how bad am I doing, right? And so uh, if we want to get better at matching, one of the things we have to know is we have to know how often we make mistakes, right? So how good or how bad are we? So, uh, so there's lack of transparency in how matching algorithms perform, uh, varied claims and performance. And so we, we need apples to apples comparison. So greater transparency, um, and there's two metrics that are actually really good, right? Precision and recall. So I'm going to go over precision and recall briefly, right? So the ideal goal of, of any matching exercise is correctly answering one question hundreds or thousands of times. You're asking the question, are these two things the same thing? Is, is Smitty Smith the same as Jonathan Smith? Is it the same as Jay Smith? Uh, and this gets really complicated when you start compounding this by, you know, potentially tens of millions of records, right? So Michigan here, we have just 10 million, but you start, uh, I actually trained at Reagan Street, so I high, so there's another 10 million there. So if you start getting interoperability across the greater region, the problem of matching becomes much, much more complicated. So really, though, if you want to just distill the matching piece, you're just asking, are these two, th are these two things the same thing? So... But in the vernacular of matching, it's correctly identifying all the true positives, true negatives, while minimizing the number of errors, false positives, and false negatives. So there's only, there's only four real outcomes that you can have a matching algorithm, right? Either a record is, is a match, it's not a match, uh, it either should match and it didn't match something, or it incorrectly made a link. And so how many of you uh, have ever uh, sorted socks by a show of hands? So the good news is we have, we're in a room full of patient matching experts. Um, right, so uh, so two, rep two records represent the same, so we can think of the socks, right, if we have two pink socks, we know that's a true positive. Uh, true negative, we have a green sock and a pink sock. I think, you know, I got my socks correct today, so, um, uh, so you know, that's a true negative. So when the algorithm makes these classifications, it, it, it's a good thing, right? So patient matching algorithms are really classification systems. Um, false negative, right, so the algorithm says, okay, we have, you know, uh, J. Smith and Mary Smith, they don't match, so false negatives, that's right. And then a, a false positive is when you, when you incorrectly, ma incorrectly match a pair of socks, right? And, and so you can think of this as, you know, there's, and there's a trade-off between the two, right? So as I increase the number of socks I match, I increase the likelihood I have a mismatched pair. Um, so I'm going to just kind of fly through this, right? This is good. So you want true positives. So if you can think of this, um, if you have two databases, right, so you, you have truth. So the, if you can see EHRA and EHRB, and then there's some sort of truth, right? And that's typically human reviewers going through and tagging the pieces of data. And if the algorithm says that's a match, we know it's a true positive. If, the, you know, if it's a non-match and it's agreement, it's true negative. And of course, um, non-match and uh, match for the algorithm is false positive and match and non-match, um, false negative. All right, so data, match status. I'm gonna just kind of keep moving because I'm running out of time. So, right, all these things we can count up. If we think, uh, you know, we have precision and recall. So they can tell us of the basket of socks, if I go through and look at every pair of socks, I can count how many of them, if I have 100 pairs of socks and 100 of them, 100 of them were correctly matched, I have a precision of 100%. Um, if I go through and I have some uh, a recall of 100%, that means every sock had a pair, right? So, so in some cases, I may, you know, want to have higher precision over higher recall. Healthcare, we tend to favor precision over recall. Uh, in national security, we tend to favor um, uh, recall over precision because we tend to think it's, uh, it, 
would be a better outcome to you know, accidentally screen more people through the airport security line than have somebody get on the, line, on the airplane and, and you know, do something bad. Um, so it's pretty simple math. Um, so I'm gonna go through a little bit of some of the work I've done. So I thought, hey, this is a great idea. I, I started my fellowship. So one of the first projects I did was evaluation of some patient matching algorithms. And so uh, Mark talked a lot about how hard it is to get data. And so it actually is really hard to get data. And, and, and it's an essential component really to, to doing anything and matching or really building any sort of model is you have to have data. So um, I did a lot of searching, a lot of questions. Uh, and, and settled on, uh, found the University of Texas, which had already, you know, really built this uh, data set that had been tagged. So in other words, human reviewers went through the different record pairs and said, this is a match, this is a non-match, right? And, and so they, this is representative of 2.6 million records, so they randomly selected 20,000 record pairs for manual review, uh, reviewed by two reviewers, split into training and test data. And so I thought, hey, let's, let's see what we've got out there in open source, so no budget, so we start with what's free when you don't have a budget. Um, and so we chose the three. So free roll, freely extensible biomedical record uh, linkage system developed by a guy named Peter Christensen uh, in Australia. Um, and it has data cleaning model, it's a hybrid model, so it uses probabilistic matching, it uses fuzzy string matching, and also some rules. Um, Dr. Christensen uh, has done some really great work uh, on matching. He actually has a really nice textbook. If you, uh, if you're, if you really want to just geek it out on uh, record linkage, I would, I would highly recommend it. Um, Frill uh, was developed at Emory University, um, so not too far uh, from where uh, Mark Bronstein was. Uh, so that was used to, uh, um, so fine grain records integration linkage tool developed by CDC and Emory. Uh, so used to link birth defects monitoring program. Uh, uh, and uses uh, machine learning, probabilistic matching, and then ChoiceMaker, um, which is a pretty good system. It's uh, used in New York Department of Public Health, used to link uh, immunization and lead registries. So I have a pretty good uh, relationship there with the team that runs that, and I've uh, been really fortunate to have a lot of really good inter interaction with them. Uh, you know, they're doing you know, tens of millions of people running their immunization and red lead registry and, and getting pretty good results. But it's uh, machine learning, probabilistic matching, and has some rules. Um, and so you can see, so we took the metrics, said precision, recall, and F-score, right? So precision was pretty consistent for all of them. Uh, recall, there was some variation. Uh, and then F-score is the combination of the two. So uh, the use of this is that basically if I were to be going to implementing an algorithm, one of the first things I could do is I could go through, pull a sample of my data set, tag the data, run multiple algorithms, and try to determine which one's going to be the best for um, my data set. And so. Uh, in this case, ChoiceMaker tended to be, you know, the best for this application, but some of the feedback we got is that the, the data set actually wasn't, um, wasn't great in that the blocking criteria they used, they only used four blocking criteria, so this um, paper, uh, the, the data set was published originally um, through Dr. Elmer Bernstein at the University of Texas, I can share that if anybody's interested, but it goes through and it shows the different blocking uh, categories they used, and so, uh, one of the things we learned is that, you know, maybe this wasn't the most uh, rigorous blocking criteria, so there's probably a lot more complex matches that we could have uh, put into the system. So the, the advanced probabilistic matchers are going to really, uh, they're, they're really good at creating links. So if you give it, you know, something that's not really tough, it's going to, it's really hard to really stretch some of these systems. And, and comes back to data, right? It's, um, you know, it's really hard to create a good data set uh, for testing these things. So... We have some limitations, only one data set, um, short period of time, we use simple case of uh, use case. Um, but there are some limitations, right? So there's uh, differences in data input format, differences in output format. Uh, we need to write code to compare the output. Uh, Freebo only outputs matches, so we had to basically do a subtraction between total matches, which, and plus the ones that were actually labeled matches to get which the, the, the actual matches. So it required a lot of cumbersome work to really just do an evaluation. Um, so this kind of brings us, so you're like, you know, wh why is he here talking about patient matching on fire? And so sort of the evolution of, of the work has kind of led, uh, led me into fire and why I think it's uh, a useful tool. Um, I want to highlight that, that fire isn't a solution for matching, um, but it's an enabler of matching, right? So there's an article, I did a, a workshop, uh, EJF uh, was there, and 
and, um, and, and Graham was able to attend a fire. And, and I remember not too long before the event, somebody wrote an article, you know, fire is not a solution to matching. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I don't think anybody is claiming it's a solution to matching. But what it's really great at is, is enabling, right, if, you have a, if you're a client and you have a server, getting the data in and out, right? It's an enabler of interoperability. Our end goal is interoperability. It's not, per se, matching, right? Uh, clinicians don't care. Uh, you know, if it's, you know, foggy center model or, you know, um, you know, deep learning neural nets, like they just want the results, right? So, um, so fire is a, is, a, is, a, is a great enabler of getting the data in and out. Um, so within the work I'm doing, right, we need a way to, to, one of the things I've learned is that there's actually not a one size fits all solution to matching, right? And so, uh, in doing the evaluation, we found, okay, it's really hard to evaluate these things. What if we standardize the inputs and the outputs and the interface in which um, we, could, we could fit these things in? So Fire is, you know, has some basic search capabilities, but it doesn't, it doesn't at the moment uh, necessarily have a, a, a complex probabilistic matching solution integrated into it. And so if we want to get to interoperability, we need to enhance the capability of, of doing matching uh, with a different data store. So, right, so fire is necessary but not sufficient for interoperability. There are no one size, there's no perfect algorithm. Um, there's, many, there's many matching solutions that fit well. Um, I could go, I could give a whole talk on, uh, you know, why, you know, matching is actually probably, you know, dozens of different problems and not one single problem. Um, so, but again, fire is a great solution for structure, and we've talked about, you know, the dirty data, schema matching. Uh, come, you know, so I won't get into that, right? So Fire enables a whole host of different parameters. You can search. You can search by first name. You could do date of birth. You can, uh, you could do, you know, address. You can do all sorts of different search. But if there's data quality errors, you might potentially miss something, and so that's when the the complex matching solutions come into play. And so, how can Fire help? Well. Fire can help in that, uh, you know, current matching systems, you know, all have different systems. So if we could standardize the, the matching score, um, if we can, uh, you know, so we talked about the outcomes. So, you know, potentially we have probable, possible, pro bleh, probable, possible, certainly not. There's different categorical ways we can label the, 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 the groups. So we could use some categorical label, or we could also use a scoring mechanism. If it's standardized, it makes it easy for everyone to interpret, right? If I have three algorithms and they all use a different scoring system, it makes it really hard to interpret it, right? And um, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with Smart on Fire? Yeah, so we have a good, so the whole idea is, right, I, you know, Josh has this, you know, the Smart on Fire, right? The whole idea is if we have the different components, right? If matching as a core component, if it's built in the Smart on Fire, manner, we can just plug these things in, right? And so, uh, so that's the idea is that we're, you know, borrowing from Josh and, and, and taking this idea that if we have a standard interface, um, you know, if, if we're not going to have a de facto, you know, we're not going to say you have to use this algorithm or this algorithm, if we can allow, if we can lower the bar for people to implement different matching solutions, then we can help get closer to our goal of interoperability. So you can think of a use case where a patient arrives at a provider, the provider wants to query the MPI, see if there's an existing record, um, right? So currently can't specify min-max scores. Uh, there's desire for uniformity in the search score that's returned. Um, so I just uh, did some searching and it, you know, so IBM's actually done some work uh, with uh, their Bluemix application. And so you, here's a, a JSON object. It's not a fire compliant object, but you could do a query where you take a JSON object and then you get a return sample response that's scored, right? So you can see on the top, uh, you know, you have a score of 95, um, and then it gives you a source, and then on the bottom you have a score of 94, right? We can start thinking about how we'd wanna, if I'm a provider and I do a search and I wanna run a probabilistic match that I could, you know, basically have a standard way of scoring these things in the same way when I go to Google, Google very intelligently only displays 10 results. Why? They know you're probably not gonna look beyond 10 results. So in the same way, right, we can, we can give similarity scores associated with patients in the cases where we can't do a simple deterministic match or an exact match. Um, so you could think about using fire, so uh, of the get, right? So you can get, you have your base URL, you do a patient, you, so you query the patient resource, you add your names and parameters, so you can add a whole host of them. Um, so in our case, we do a sample with Robert Smith with a birthday of, you know, 1990, 
uh, January 1st. Um, and then we could also think about adding, you know, greater thresholds. So we could potentially add, you know, a scoring system. So we have a, a single scoring system. Potentially you could add, you know, give me only the results greater than 90% match. Or if I want to do a dual threshold, I could do greater than or, or less than. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. But um, um, so, so that's kind of like my grand vision. And at the moment, there's some work going at ONC uh, and MITRE. Uh, where they're working on a test harness for the different matching systems. So where the rubber meets the road, if you're not really, if you've got a matching solution and you're thinking about implementing it, this might be some potential open source code you could use. Um, so, it, you know, you could also use the fire, the test harness as a fire-based interface for testing patient matching systems. Um, but, you know, it could, there's a lot of potential, I think, here. So, um, so the desired end state, so fire-based interaction with test harness and record matching systems. Um, it could help potentially facilitate the comparison of multiple matching systems. So if you're an HIE and you're looking at uh, testing multiple matching systems, the test harness could be a resource in which you would use to determine what is the best matcher that I want to use for my application. Um, and then for time's sake, I'll keep moving on. So here's kind of a simple schematic. So right now there's an implementation written to Frill. So Frill takes CSV as an input, and so there's an adapter that will take that CSV. Uh, convert, it, convert it into a fire uh, message um, and then uh, allow you to uh, ingest it and then it can spit back the results to, uh, in a fire compliant uh, fashion. Um, and then of course here, here are some links for the resources. Um, if you have questions, let me know. I can put you in contact with the, uh, the folks. But most of the, you know, a lot of the resources are here. This is still really early stage development. Um, and then I'll just take some quick questions. Can you clarify again what blocking is in this context? Uh, blocking, so when you, ah, I wish I had some backup slides. So when you start with an, an initial data set, um, you're not, if you're gonna do matching, it's n times n comparison. So a, I think it's a comparison of 10,000 records comes out to, let's see if I can do the math on spot, it's like t uh, is it 10 million? Anyways, uh, it, it, it has computational complexity, so it's very com computational intensive. So most record linkage systems will select a set of values to do matches off. So for example, when I talked about development of a reference data set is they did, um, okay, give me all records that match on SSN, give me all records that match on last name and date of birth, give me these, and so it pulls a subset of those records out and does a comparison, then does the full comparison on it. So it's similar to indexing. You're not gonna, you're not, it, it's pretty rare unless you have money for a supercomputer that you're gonna do a full pairwise comparison. So it's, if I'm doing a, a match from two data systems, you know, it's n times n, and then also times the number of attributes you're matching. So if you have eight attributes and, you know, 10,000 records, it's, it, it, you know, if you want a result, you don't have 24 hours to get a result back. You, you need it now. It's, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to write a query and get a response back in 24 hours. Um, so that's the idea. It's, yeah. All right, well, thank you for your time, and uh, thanks for uh, having me.